What's up everybody, Unrested back again today with another top 10 list. I got a great response on yesterday's top 10 list of my top 10 pet peeves about Japan. And in following up today, like I said I would do top 10 things that are like Pokemon but real life in Japan. What I mean by that is things that you do when you play the game and see in the game of the Pokemon games, everything from red on up to what is our newest ones like Omega Red, uh, Omega Ruby, Sapphire Alpha, Sapphire... I can't, you know, I bought the game. I don't even remember the names exactly. My favorite, my all-time favorite games are Black and White. I like that series the most. A lot of people hate my opinion on that. That's fine. It is just my opinion. It is not a fact at all. Okay, guys, I'm going to go ahead through this. This is a list from 1 to 10 in no particular order of things that you see in the Pokemon games. And this spans all the series, but you tend to see them in almost every series. Um, and this is mostly sticking to the overall RPG versions of the game, the ones on Game Boy Advance, original Game Boy, uh, the DS, the 3DS, uh, sticking to those little classic RPG games on there. You may see some of these things maybe in some of the other different games like Pokemon Snap or uh, what is it, Pikachu TV? I know there's like a bunch of little side games that didn't do so hot that weren't as fun to play but still do exist. I can't deny them. I don't know if those are in these. I'm not including those. I'm just usually saying stuff that you see in the RPGs that is true to life in Japan. Things that you will actually see why I know that is because I live in Japan, in case you didn't know that. This is this is Japan, everybody. Here it is. Right now I'm in Kobe. Um, okay, let's get right into it. Um, number one, absent dads. In every Pokemon game, your dad is not present. There is actually one game, or actually I think maybe two games, where you meet your dad at a gym. Usually they are either searching for Pokemon, hunting for po Pokemon, researching Pokemon, or... Uh, competing Pokemon battles at the gyms or training at gyms or a gym leader. Um, that being said, even when you do finally see them, they are at a job, right? So this is pretty common in Japan. Uh, dads tend to have to work long, rigorous hours at their job, sometimes 12 hours to 16 hours a day at a job and are barely ever seen by their kids. It's such a problem, in fact, that people actually have died from overwork in Japan and it is a actual word in the language known as karoshi, death from overwork. That's right, people do get entirely too overworked in Japan and it's actually such a social problem, it's to the point where there is a disconnect between fathers and their sons at some points due to the fact that they never get to see their kids grow up. Some points there's even been problems where when the father does finally retire from work, the wife divorces him, the kids totally disconnect any connection to him. He moves away into a small apartment where he lives out the rest of his days as a hermit. Kind of a sad fact, but true and seen in Pokemon. You almost never seen your dad, and when you do, he's at work. Alright, number two, ambiguous sexual nature or somewhat nebulous sexual nature. For example, Team Rocket from the cartoon. We often can't really tell exactly what their sexual nature is. Nonetheless, you never see that mocked, you never see that made fun of. It's a very open and accepted thing in Japan. This is very true. Japan is not like our Western counterparts, especially my Western counterpart, my home country of America, that is very, at times, bigoted and kind of aggressive and confrontational to anyone of a ambiguous or sexual nature unlike their own. In Japan, no one really cares. You can be openly gay on the street, you can be openly transgender. In fact, there's many celebrities who are transgender here in Japan and many celebrities who are ambiguous about their sexual nature. It's not a big deal, widely accepted, very open and liberal country. One thing I love about Japan. Number three, little kids traveling by themselves. This is very true. Kids in Japan do tend to travel by themselves, though. Why that is, is because crime is very low in Japan. Yes, child murders do happen. It's a sad fact of life, but it is far, 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 far less than anything you would see in a country like my own, like America, once again. Um, child murders are not very common. A child kidnapping is not very common. You, of course, can find news articles where it has happened, and recently even there was an 11-year-old child who was murdered by a man who was schizophrenic. Um, sad situation, but it was in the news. Um, nonetheless, if each and every day that I travel to the train, I see multiple kids who are anywhere from six, seven, sometimes as young as five, walking to their own train stop, getting on the train, taking the train to their destination, getting off and actually walking to their kindergarten. Why do I know this? Is because some of those kindergartens I have taught at. I have been an international kindergarten teacher 
uh, I did it for five years in Japan. So oftentimes I saw these kids go to their school by themselves. I was not following little kids around Japan. <laughs> okay. Um, areas of the land being haunted. For example, the Pokemon Graveyard. Uh, very, very uh, famous lavender song that's constantly played for that area is kind of a uh, dark, sort of brooding area. And even the word lavender, if any of you know, that usually is associated with the purple color, the, the color purple, because lavender is a purple color, it is a variation thereof. Um, oftentimes, this is an association with something known as the blue forest or the blue sea or also known as Aoki Gahara which Aoi means blue, Ki means tree so uh, it's a connection to that area of Japan so that's actually what they're I guess alluding to in this uh, of course this would never be stated by Nintendo Nintendo wouldn't come out and be like yeah our inspiration is a place that people commit suicide at um, Aoki Gahara is often known as the suicide forest it's a sad but true fact that oftentimes people wander into that forest and commit suicide due to the fact that either number one it is very hard to find their body once they've wandered in there and succumb to the elements and also number two because oftentimes they can make it look like it was not a suicide but instead an accident of getting lost in the forest and dying uh, keeping shame away from their family which oftentimes committing suicide can make a family lose face although sometimes it is seen as an honorable death in Japan at the same time um, of course once again I'm not promoting or glorifying suicide uh, and if you are suicidal please get the help you need um, stop watching this video and watch my Dark Side of Japan video on suicide, which uh, has a lot of numbers that you can contact about getting help about suicidal thoughts. Wow, that turned to dark really fast. Um, <laughs> let's get on to number five. Train stations look the same. Um, that's one thing that really amazed me as I played every series. The little train stations that they have, like the battle train stations that they have, uh, especially starting with black and white and moving on up to the most current ones, um, X and Y as well. Those train stations look exactly how train stations look in Japan. Like even down to the little signs that are all the different colors and everything and what the train lines look like. If you want to know what a train in Japan looks like, the subways and all different local trains and stuff like that, they look almost exactly the same. Like some of the same colors, sometimes names are only slightly off from what they actually are in Japan. So it's pretty interesting to me. Vending machines everywhere. It is a fact that out of every 13 people living in Japan, there is one vending machine. That's a lot of vending machines. When you've got a country of almost 130 million people, do the math and figure out how many vending machines that is. That's a lot. That means they are on every street corner. A lot of people talk to me about how they saw a ton in the new Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. Yeah, there is a ton. It's true. There's uh, everywhere. I can see one. Let's see. Just looking out right here, I can see one over at the post office. Um, and I can see two, three, four over by a pet store, and one of them's an ice cream uh, vending machine. So that's kind of interesting. In the middle of winter, an ice cream vending machine. A little bit rare. Um, one thing I will say, though, kind of a myth about Japan, people always talk about you can find all kinds of crazy stuff in the vending machine, like there's like panties and stuff like that. That's just a myth. It's not true. I mean, I've, in my nine years living in Japan, I've never seen panties in a vending machine. There are porno magazines that you can buy, and panties aren't included in that, but I think that's a little more obvious association, porno mag, you know, panties, not just random public vending machines where little kids can walk around and see that for sale. That's that's not common. Uh, there are beer vending machines though, which are pretty common, and there's just no ID check or anything. Anyone of any age can just put some coins in and get a beer, although they do tend to turn off at 11 p.m., which is kind of strange for a vending machine to turn off. Okay, number seven, store staff does not push you to purchase. When you walk into a store in Japan, the Pokemon shops, no one actually comes up to you and asks you what you'd like to buy. You can leisurely take your time, look around the shop, and not have any pushy customer service come around to tell you what to buy or push any kind of product on you. Very true of Japan. They enjoy giving you a uh, non-confrontational, uh, non-aggressive shopping experience. You come in and usually, if you want to ask for help, then you will receive just as much as you need, but Otherwise, they're going to leave you alone and let you shop. A lot of people don't like to be accosted as soon as they walk into a store. And sometimes even when Japanese people go over to overseas places where they shop and people try to push products on them pretty fast, they get kind of scared away by that almost because they're just not used to that kind of atmosphere when walking into a place that they're going to purchase something. 
All right, number eight, people don't lock their doors. In the game, you can walk into almost anybody's house, uh, come on in and chat with people. Um, in general, yeah, it's pretty common, even in the most deep city areas, maybe unless you got into like the ghettos of Tokyo or like maybe where I used to live before in Nippon Bashi, the ghetto of Osaka or Do Dobutsu en Mae, which literally means in front of the zoo. Um, those areas you might want to lock your door. I think there's probably still people there that do leave the doors unlocked. In general, crime is not a big problem in Japan. Um, you can leave your door unlocked. Where I live now, if somebody is home at the house, usually we have our door unlocked. We have had zero crimes happen to us. Um, that's not saying you should come to Japan and just leave your door unlocked all the time. I and mean, if you want to lock your door, of course you can. No one's going to care. Um, that being said, though, it is very true that you uh, can actually have a time uh, in Kyoto. There's a Matsuri where people literally open the doors to their house and you can walk the streets of Kyoto and if someone has their door open they're part of this Matsuri if you don't know what a Matsuri is it's a festival and this festival is kind of like the introduction to your house festival and you can come to this part of Kyoto and walk into anybody's house who has their door open and they will offer you things like tea and manju which is like a zuki bean mixed into mochi and stuff like that um, it's it's pretty friendly. It's a pretty outgoing atmosphere. It's kind of like Pokemon where you can just walk in and start chatting it up with people in their houses. Number nine, collecting capsules, also known as gacha gacha capsules. Um, if you don't know what gacha gacha means, it's pretty much the Japanese word for the sound that the capsule machine makes when you turn the knob to make the capsule come out. It's like gacha 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 gacha. And um, that is a very popular thing in Japan. Of course, you know, we've got capsules that the animals are in inside of the game, but there's also little collectibles that are capsules as well. Collectibles inside of capsules all over Japan has always been popular for a very, very long time and is still very popular today. There's actually entire shops that rotate completely around selling what is inside those capsules by first purchasing many, many of those capsules, opening them up and then repackaging them into plastic packages that they then sell for how rare they are is how high the price goes. So if it's something that is really hard to find in those capsule machines because there are some very rare runs, then the price goes high. And uh, one of those best stores, if you ever come to Osaka, my part of Japan, check out Superposition. Superposition is a wonderful store for finding all your capsule needs. And uh, number 10, all right, we're on to our last one. Many Pokemon are actually representations of Japanese yokai or kaibutsu. If you don't know what yokai or kaibutsu is, kaibutsu is pretty much an overall term for monsters. It can include everything from ghosts to demons to ogres and orcs and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and yokai is pretty much a specific type of kaibutsu, which is a demon. For example, the kappa, many people know, is a turtle-looking demon that eats cucumbers and has like kind of a water dish in its head. Very strange to look at. Um, if you knock that water out of its head, it loses its magical power. Already you can start to see where that creature alone is very much like a Pokemon. But there are some very specific ones and I wrote those down. Some of my favorite ones, Slowbro, who also has Slowking as part of their tribe or whatever they are. I don't know how you classify groups of Pokemon. Um, Saze, uh, Sazai Oni, Sazai Oni. Sorry, mispronunciation. Sazai Oni is a, how do I describe this yokai? Okay, so it's like a woman and she's inside of a conch shell, kind of like uh, Slowbro or Slow King is. And she floats in the water and when fishermen would come by this shell, uh, she would come out of the shell, kind of like a snail would. And they'd be like, oh, you're so beautiful. Come on, let me uh, get a kissy kiss. And they'd lean over their boat to kiss them. and. Uh, that woman would drag them into the water and they would drown and die. Wow, that sucks. A little bit, uh, not as nice as Slowbro there, not as nice as Slow King. Um, and this is my all-time favorite one, and trust me, you're gonna have to agree with this one 100%. Maybe, maybe you would take a look at Salzioni and be like, okay, Scott, that's a bit of a stretch. Take a look at a creature called Baku, and Baku's connection to Hypno. Now, as many of you know, Hypno is this Pokemon that messes with your dreams and can hypnotize you and can screw up things that you're dreaming about. There's also even a lot of creepy pastas about him, about how he steals children away via dreams, and there's like a really creepy poem that surrounds him. Um, look up Baku. Baku is a yokai, a demon that is known as the Dream Eater. Wow. Yeah. 
Uh, you'll also notice there's a couple other dream-related uh, Pokemon that are very, very close to Baku. And he's kind of got this kind of mix between like an elephant and a mammoth and, I don't know, some kind of like leopard-type animal all mixed together. Exactly what Baku looks like. Take a look, check him out. Baku, he is a yokai that is a demon. And it kind of always makes me think, you know, Yokai Watch, which is now starting to become more popular than Pokemon. I mean, they're literally stealing the same idea away. I mean, don't don't get me wrong, Yokai Watch is cool, and if you like it, I'm not slamming it. If it's your favorite show, I'm not trying to slam your favorite show. But Yokai Watch is just pretty much admitting that they're taking the Yokai straight from Japanese history or things like the Hyakumono Gatari, which is like a book about a hundred different demons and stuff like that. They're just literally turning that into a game instead of saying, oh, these are a reference for the monsters that we created. They're just literally saying, we don't take a reference. We're literally just going to use these monsters and make cartoony versions of them that this kid can come find and collect. Um, not very different from Pokemon. Anyway, that being said, that is my top 10 ways Pokemon is just like real Japan. If you have more, I would love to hear ways in which you know that Pokemon in Japan are kind of the same. What things have you seen that you've watched either on TV about Japan or maybe you've visited Japan and seen something that is very much alike the game? Please comment below, let me know. I would love to hear your views on this. If you like this video today, please like, comment, and subscribe, and let me know what you'd like to see for a future top 10. I'm Unrested, and I'll see you next time.